Hello everyone, Neuralnars Hands here, and today I have a inverter repair video. We're going to be looking at the Wagon Tech 400 watt inverter. This isn't very valuable, but I'm just going to show you what I'm going to do to attempt to repair this. And there are certain reasons why I chose to purchase this inverter, even though it's really not worth much. I think its original selling price was around $40. But in any case, I got this, some battery clamps, which are of rather disappointing quality, to be honest. And I got this, a cigarette lighter adapter with ring terminals. And this is one of the reasons why I purchased it, because I wanted one of these adapters. I'm getting a more valuable inverter in the future, in the mail, and I want to have one of these to connect it up. Sure, I can make my own, or I can purchase this. Then I get one of these, and an inverter. In any case, before we start on the actual inverter, let's see if this adapter is any good. I've already checked the continuity from here to these leads, so I know that's good, and uh, I'm going to have to uh, see why this spring isn't working properly. It seems to be jammed at the moment. There we go. I just had it too tight. Anyway, and uh, that also means that the fuse is good, so I verified that this plug adapter works. And the fuse is 16 amps, and the reason I'm mentioning that right now is because a lot of people purchase inverters like this one here. Sure, it's a 400 watt inverter, but do not expect to power 400 watts off of it. At least, not with one of these. Your cigarette lighter adapter can only do about 150 watts, and it is actually fused at 16 amps in this case. 150 watts, it's all you get out of a cigarette lighter adapter. If you want more, then you need clamps, like these, that connect directly up to your battery or electrical system somewhere. These, however, are very light duty and somewhat disappointing. But in any case, this is the inverter. <clears throat> I got this inverter, those two cables, and also some miscellaneous packaging that I don't really need, so I'm going to set those aside. And I also got this. What is this? Well, I'll tell you what it is. It goes right here. It is a warning label that's supposed to be adhered to the bottom of the inverter. But over time, apparently it decided to unstick itself. Very well, nobody likes warning labels. We'll toss that aside. On this side, however, we have a bigger issue because this is not a warning label. It's a label that's supposed to be adhered to the inverter, and it fell off. So I'm just going to re-glue that back on. No problem. But in the meantime, the bottom is really messed up. So let's clean this off. I normally don't show this step, but it is important if you're going to be reselling products to keep this clean. I don't know if I'm actually going to resell this. I'll probably end up keeping it, but that's beside the point. What I like to use to clean off residue, you can use uh, like a, a goof off, for example. It's a commercial product works pretty well. I usually don't use that because it's very harsh. Usually I just use IPA, rubbing alcohol, and that works pretty well. Let's see how it works in this case. This video is not premeditated. I was going to take a look at this inverter today and I thought, hey, you know what? I'll just make a video out of it. Maybe somebody will be interested in watching. So put some IPA on the back, let it soak into the adhesive, and here I just have an old rag, it's a terry cloth that I use to uh, put some uh, black stuff on the trim on my car, basically a tire wet in a gel form, but in any case it doesn't have to be clean for this because it's just going to get sticky residue all over it, and I don't want to get sticky residue all over something good, so it's had a little time to soak in. Let's see if this residue comes off now. Sure, I could glue this label back on also, but who wants a warning label on their product? I don't, so even if I keep it, I don't really want that label. I'm just going to scrub the stuff off. And it seems to be coming off pretty well. I'll just continue this, and when I'm done, I'll turn the camera back on. And after only a minute or so of work, it's pretty well clean. There's just a little bit of residue left, but I'm not going to worry about that. It's scratched up anyway. On the top, I'll glue the sticker on later. For now, I'm not going to worry about it. 
So let's inspect it. Looks to be in pretty good shape overall. Screw terminals seem to work. The fan, see if that works. Seems to have pretty good bearings. It takes a while for it to stop again. So, no issues so far. I'm told this doesn't work. I don't actually know if it doesn't work. Sometimes they do, even when they're advertised that they don't, because someone doesn't know how to use it. But for the most part, things are worse than advertised, and that's fully what I expect here. So let's do a few initial checks on this inverter. And for that, all you need is a standard multimeter. So let's take a look here. I have it on ohms, and let's see if the input is shorted, because sometimes it is. And no, it is not shorted. It is open circuit, usually a good sign. So let's take a look at the output. One thing that I'm always in interested in is the grounding configuration. Is ground connected to case ground? If I can do this. Yes, ground is connected to case ground, as it should be. Is ground also connected to battery negative? That's sometimes it interesting to know. And yes, on this particular inverter, it is. The input is not isolated from the output. <clears throat> the output ground is battery negative. For most things, that doesn't matter, but it's a point of interest. One more thing I'd like to check is to see if neutral is connected to ground. On better inverters, it usually is. On cheaper ones, it's usually not. Let's see what this Wagon Tech inverter is. And it is not. So, this inverter has a live neutral configuration. That's not terrible, but keep that in mind. In any case, the input is not shorted. How about the output? That's usually the next thing I check. So, let's check the output. One lead in there, one lead in there, and my meter says 77 kilo ohms. That's not shorted either. So, very interesting. I have no idea what's wrong with this inverter. Sometimes these are easily repairable, sometimes they take a lot of work. We'll see about this one. Take off these knobs, get them out of the way, and, uh, well, the next step is not too surprising. Open it up. Looks like this one has a couple of screws. I don't know where they go or what they do. I assume they hold on the end panel, but if you remove enough fasteners, eventually almost anything comes apart, so that's what I'm going to do here. <clears throat> I'm not actually going to review this product here because that may be a later video. I'm actually quite interested in this inverter because they advertise that it has a 1000 watt surge, which is, well, does it really? I doubt it, but if it does, that would be pretty unique among a 400 watt inverter. I'm pretty sure that you can't get 100 amps through these dinky little cables though, so yeah, I'm pretty sure it doesn't, but anyway, that is for a later video. <clears throat> so I took out those screws, see if we can get this, this plate off the back. It doesn't want to slide out. It should just slide out of here. But, uh, let me figure this out and I'll turn the camera back on again. Well, I can't seem to figure it out. This has to just slide out, so when all else fails, use more force. And indeed, it does just slide out. It just doesn't want to go very willingly. For some reason. I'm not sure why. And at the moment, I don't care. Let's just get this thing out of here. With this cover out of the way, we can finally see what's inside, and this has a somewhat interesting construction. These transistors don't actually heatsink to the outside, like in most products. They heatsink to a heatsink block inside, which is an insert. That's kind of unusual, and it seems quite wasteful to me, but perhaps they have a reason for doing that. Not sure what the reason is, or what their justification is, but 
In any case, we'll just go with it for now and take that one screw out that holds everything together and slide the whole thing out. We can now set this aside and we're left with just the actual product. So let's do a quick inspection. Here's a close-up of the inside of this inverter and overall the build quality seems to be pretty decent. I don't have a lot to complain about here. Print circuit board is pretty decent quality. They do have some kludgy things going on like this hand soldered on capacitor but and this resistor as well. But overall, it's not terrible. It is a low-cost product. Um, it certainly has its issues, but I'll just call it acceptable. They have the input stage over here, which is just two TO220 FETs. And on the output side, they have four. I can't read the part numbers without unscrewing them, but those are just four transistors, the bare minimum. And that's just fine in what you would expect for a 400 watt inverter. But one thing you may notice is this orange crusty stuff. That's not supposed to be there. This is capacitor guts. How do I know that? Well, because this. These are capacitors that have blown their tops. And this is why you don't connect inverters backward. Yeah, don't reverse positive and negative cables. Bad things happen. In this case, these capacitors blew their guts out. And those guts now reside all over the place. So these capacitors are obviously bad, and I should remove them. It's very possible that many other things were damaged in here as well. The fuse is not blown. That fuse is still good. So what I'm going to do is remove these two capacitors. They don't do any good anymore. And we'll see what happens after that. If some of the drive circuitry over here is uh, burnt out, blown up, then this whole thing is just garbage. But if not, maybe it's still repairable. So I'm going to grab my soldering iron and remove these two capacitors. These are input capacitors, and at light load, they're not really necessary. They're still helpful, but not entirely necessary, because you still get input power through these cables. At heavy loads, they are pretty critical, and you will have to replace these. But that's a topic for the future, if this thing still works. So I'm going to remove those caps. I got my soldering iron out, but decided that instead what I'm going to do is just break them off. This one here, I just wiggled back and forth till it broke off, and it's kind of interesting. You can see its construction. They just have this uh, electrolyte impregnated paper and a rubber bung on the bottom inside of an aluminum case. This is a standard aluminum electrolytic capacitor. And this is the can that was on this one here. I just pulled the can off because it was pretty well popped off already from the electrolyte flashing into steam when they connected this in reverse polarity. This is a 2200 microfarad, microfarad 16 volt capacitor. So this inverter has a pretty good input capacitance for a 400 watt inverter. That's 4400 microfarads. 16 volts isn't that great, but we'll ignore that for now. So I could desolder this, but instead I'm just going to wiggle this cap back and forth until it breaks off, because that's a lot easier. And in my initial test, I just want to see if the rest of this inverter works, because if it doesn't, it isn't really worth repairing. It is a 400 watt inverter that sells for 30 or 40 bucks, and I'm not going to waste my time on it if the drive circuitry or whatnot is fried. So I'll just remove this cap this way and then we'll give it a test.